Hello there, Space Raiders. My name is Eve, Y-V-E-S, Eve. If you are returning, welcome back. If this is your first time here, then welcome. Um, what I do basically is just read a few chapters out of a book and take little breaks um, when people come in or leave and do some chit-chatting. So kind of a little, little book club here. Um, this morning we are reading from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sequel, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe by Douglas Adams. Um, yesterday we left off... Um, as I believe our gang was attempting to escape from uh, De Seattle Hot Black's ship, stunt ship, which is about to crash into a sun. So we're picking up from there. They found a broken teleporter. I'm uh, just having my coffee, which is extraordinarily hot. So I've changed my mind about sipping that just now. But we will go ahead and just jump straight into it then. Chapter 22. Arthur woke up and instantly regretted it. Hangovers he'd had, but never anything on this scale. This was it. This was the big one. This was the ultimate pits. Matter transference beams, he decided, were not as much fun as, say, a good solid kick in the head. Being, for the moment, unwilling to move on account of a dull, stomping throb he was experiencing, he lay a while and thought. The trouble with most fo forms of transport, he thought, is basically that not one of them is worth all the bother. On Earth, when there had been an Earth before it was demolished to make way for a new hyperspace bypass, the problem had been with cars. The disadvantages involved in pulling lots of black, sticky slime out of the ground where it had been safely hidden out of harm's way, turning it into tar to cover the land with, smoke to fill the air with, and pouring the rest into the sea, all seemed to outweigh the advantages of being able to get more quickly from one place to another particularly when the place you arrived at had probably become, as a result of this, very similar to the place you had left, i.e. covered with tar, full of smoke, and short of fish. And what about metatransference beams? Any form of transport which involved tearing you apart atom by atom, flinging those atoms through the subether and then jamming them back together again just when they were first getting their first taste of freedom for years, had to be bad news. Many people had thought exactly this before Arthur Dent had even gone to the lengths of writing songs about it. Uh, here is one that used to regularly be chanted by huge crowds outside the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation Teleport Systems Factory on Happy World 3. Aldebaran's great okay. Algol's pretty neat. Beetlejuice's pretty girls will knock you off your feet. They'll do anything you like real fast and then real slow. But if you have to take me apart to get there, then I don't want to go. Take me apart, take me apart, what a way to roam. And if you have to take me apart to get there, I'd rather stay at home. Sirius is paved with gold, so I've heard it said, by nuts who then go on to say, see Tao before you're dead. I'll gladly take the high road or even take the low, but if you have to take me apart to get there, then I for one won't go. Take me apart, take me apart, you must be off your head. And if you try to take me apart to get there, I'll stay right here in bed. And so on. Another favorite song was much shorter. I teleported home one night with Ron and Sid and Meg. Ron stole Maggie's heart away and I got Sidney's leg. Arthur felt the waves of pain slowly receding, though he was still aware of a dull stomping throb. Slowly, carefully, he stood up. Can you hear a dull, stomping throb, said Ford Prefect. Arthur spun around and wobbled uncertainly. Ford Prefect was approaching, looking red-eyed and pasty. Where are we? gasped Arthur. Ford looked around. They were standing in a long, curving corridor with stretched out of sight, which stretched out of sight in both directions. The outer steel wall, which was painted in that sickly shade of pale green which they use in schools, hospitals, and mental asylums to keep the inmates subdued, curved over the tops of their heads to where it met the inner perpendicular wall, which, oddly enough, was covered in dark brown hessian wall weave. The floor was of dark green ribbed rubber. Ford moved over to a very thick, dark, transparent panel set in the outer, outer wall. It was several layers deep, yet through it he could see pinpoints of distant stars. 
I think we're in a spaceship of some kind, he said. Down the corridor came the sound of a dull stomping throb. Trillion, called Arthur nervously. Zaphod? Ford shrugged. Nowhere about, he said. I've looked. They could be anywhere. An unprogrammed teleport can throw you light years in any direction. Judging by the way I feel, I think we've traveled a very long way indeed. How do you feel? <laughs> Bad. Do you think they're... Where they are, how they are, there's no way we can know and no way we can do anything about it. Do what I do. What? Don't think about it. Arthur turned this thought over in his mind, reluctantly saw the wisdom of it, tucked it up, and put it away. He took a deep breath. Footsteps! exclaimed Ford suddenly. Where? That noise, that stomping throb, pounding feet. Listen. Arthur listened. The noise echoed round the corridor at them from an inter indeterminate distance. It was the muffled sound of pounding footsteps, and it was noticeably louder. Let's move, said Ford sharply. They both moved in opposite directions. Not that way, said Ford. That's where they're coming from. No, it's not, said Arthur. They're coming from that way. They're not. They're... They both stopped. They both turned. They both listened intently. They both agreed with each other. They both set off in opposite directions again. Fear gripped them. From both directions, the noise was getting louder. A few yards to their left, another corridor ran at right angles to the inner wall. They ran to it and hurried along it. It was dark, immensely long, and as they passed down it, gave them the impression that it was getting colder and colder. Other corridors gave it gave off it to the left and right, each very dark, and each subjecting them to sharp blasts of icy air as they passed. They stopped for a moment in alarm. The further down the corridor they went, the louder became the sound of pounding feet. They pressed themselves back against the cold wall and listened furiously. The cold, the dark, and the drumming of disembodied feet was getting to them badly. Ford shivered, partly with the cold, but partly with the memory of stories of his, fa his favorite mother used to tell him when he was a mere slip of a Betelgeusean, ankle high to an Arcturian mega grasshopper. Stories of death ships, haunted hulks that roamed restlessly round the obscure regions of space, infested with demons or the ghosts of forgotten crews. Stories, too, of incautious travelers who found and entered such ships. Stories of... And then Ford remembered the brown Hessian wall weave in the first corridor and pulled himself together. However ghosts and demons may choose to decorate their death hulks, he thought to himself, he would lay any money you liked it wasn't with Hessian wall weave. He grabbed Arthur by the arm. Back the way we came, he said firmly, and they started to retrace their steps. A moment later, they leapt like startled lizards down the nearest corridor junction as the owners of the drumming feet suddenly hove into view directly in front of them. Hidden behind the corner, they goggled in amazement as about two dozen overweight men and women pounded past them in tracksuits, panting and wheezing in a manner that would make a heart surgeon gibber. Ford Prefect stared after them. Joggers, he hissed as the sound of their feet echoed away up and down the network of corridors. Joggers, whispered Arthur Dent. Joggers, said Ford Prefect with a shrug. The corridor they were concealed in was not like the others. It was very short and ended at a large steel door. Ford examined it, discovered the opening mechanism, and pushed it wide. The first thing that hit their eyes was what appeared to be a coffin. And the next 4,999 things that hit their eyes were also coffins. Hello, Krim. How are you, my dear? Elite dog, 18. My ears, ah, uh, shut up. Oh, my eyes, ah, uh, get out of my chat room. <clears throat> my voice is very... I feel like the, the timber is kind of low and big today. I, I kind of dig it. It doesn't feel rough or bad or anything. Also, hello, OSX. How are you today? Welcome back. Glad to have you. <clears throat> 
And yes, this is chapters 22 to whatever I feel like today. Chapter 23. The vault was low-ceilinged, dimly lit, and gigantic. At the far end, about 300 yards away, an archway let through to what appeared to be a similar chamber, similarly occupied. Ford Prefect let out a low whistle as he stepped down to the floor of the vault. Wild, he said. What's so great about dead people? asked Arthur, nervously stepping down after him. Dunno, said Ford. Let's find out, shall we? On closer inspection, the coffin seemed to be more like sarcophagi. They stood about waist high and were constructed of what appeared to be white marble, which is almost certainly what it was, something that only appeared to be white marble. The tops were semi-translucent, and through them could dimly be perceived the features of their late and presumably, presumably lamented occupants. They were humanoid, and it had clearly left the and had clearly left the troubles of whatever world it was they came from far behind them. But beyond that, little else could be discerned. Hello, Robo Money. Yes, that is a Ninja Turtle. That is my Donatello. It's my Donnie. He was a birthday gift two years ago, I think, for my little sister when I got her into Ninja Turtles. I don't know if there's a better or a worse Ninja Turtle. They're just different. They're bros. Donnie's my favorite. <clears throat> Rolling slowly round the floor between the sarcophagi was a heavy, oily white gas, which Arthur at first thought might be there to give the palace a little atmosphere, until he discovered that it also froze his ankles. The sarcophagi, too, were intensely cold to the touch. Ford suddenly crouched down beside one of them. He pulled a corner of his towel out of his satchel and started to rub furiously at something. Look, there's a plaque on this one, he explained to Arthur. It's frosted over. He rubbed the frost clear and examined the engraved characters. To Arthur, they looked like the footprints of a spider that had one too many of whatever it is that spiders have on a night out. But Ford instantly recognized as an early form of galactic easier read. It says, Golga Frencham Arc Fleet, Ship B, Hold 7, Telephone Sanitizer 2nd Class, and a serial number. A telephone sanitizer? said Arthur. A dead telephone sanitizer? Be kind. But what's he doing here? Ford peered through the top at the figure within. Not a lot he said, and suddenly flashed one of those grins of, of his, which always made people think he'd been overdoing things recently and should try to get some rest. He scampered over to another sarcophagus. A moment's brisk towel work, and he announced, This one's a dread, dead hairdresser. Hoopee! The next sarcophagus revealed itself to be the last resting place of an advertising account executive. The one after that contained a second-hand car salesman, third class. An inspection hatch let into the floor suddenly caught Ford's attention, and he squatted down to unfasten it, thrashing away at the clouds of freezing gas that threatened to envelop him. A thought occurred to Arthur. If these are just coffins, he said, why are they kept so cold? Or, indeed, why are they kept anyway, said Ford, tugging the hatchway open. The gas poured down through it. Why, in fact, is anyone going to all the trouble and expense of carting 5,000 dead bodies through space? 10,000, said Arthur, pointing at the archway through which the next chamber was dimly visible. Ford stuck his head through the floor hatchway. He looked up again. 15,000, he said. There's a lot down here. 15 million, said a voice. That's a lot, said Ford. A lot, a lot. Turn around slowly, barked the voice, and put your hands up. Any other move and I blast you into tiny, tiny bits. Hello, said Ford, turning round slowly, putting his hands up and not making any other move. Why, said Arthur Dent, isn't anyone ever pleased to see us? Standing silhouetted in the doorway through which they had entered the vault was the man who was not pleased to see them. 
His displeasure was communicated partly by the barking, hectoring quality of his voice, and partly by the viciousness with which he waved a long silver kilo zap gun at them. The designer of the gun had clearly not been instructed to beat about the bush. Make it evil, he'd been told. Make it totally clear that this gun has a right end and a wrong end. Make it totally clear to anyone standing at the wrong end that things are going badly for them. If that means sticking all sorts of spikes and prongs and blackened bits all over it, then so be it. This is not a gun for hanging over the pot fireplace or sticking in the umbrella stand. It is a gun for going out and making people miserable with. Ford and Arthur looked at the gun unhappily. The man with the gun moved from the door and circled round them. As he came into the light, they could see his black and gold uniform, on which the buttons were so highly polished that they shone with an intensity that would have made an approaching motorist flash his lights in annoyance. He gestured at the door. Out, he said. People who can supply that amount of firepower don't need to supply verbs as well. Ford and Arthur went out, closely followed by the wrong end of a kilo zap gun and the buttons. Turning into the corridor, they were jostled by 24 oncoming joggers, now showered and changed, who swept on past them into the vault. Arthur turned to watch them in confusion. Move! screamed their captor. Arthur moved. Ford shrugged and moved. In the vault, the joggers went to 24 empty sarcophagi along the side wall, opened them, climbed in, and fell into 24 dreamless sleeps. I should read poetry. Hey, tell you what, if you send me some poetry that you'd like to hear, I'll read it on my stream. I have no problem with that. I think that would be lovely. And that follow is nothing, Krim. It's a troll. I get a lot of those. Oh, and thank you for hosting OSX. I didn't even see. My alerts are not working for some reason. Like, they're not showing. <clears throat> Chapter 24. Our captain. Yes, number one. Just had a sort of report thingy from number two. Oh, dear. High up in the bridge of the ship, the captain stared out into the infinite reaches of space with mild irritation. From where he reclined beneath a wide domed bubble, he could see before and above him the vast panorama of stars through which they were moving, a panorama that had thinned out noticeably during the course of the voyage. Turning and looking backward over the vast two-mile bulk of the ship, he could see the far denser mass of stars behind them, which seemed to form almost a solid band. This was the view through the galactic center from which they were traveling, and indeed had been traveling for years, at a speed that he couldn't quite remember at the moment, but he knew it was terribly fast. It was something approaching the speed of something or other, or was it three times the speed of something else? Jolly impressive, anyway. He peered into the bright distance behind the ship, looking for something. He did this every few minutes or so, but never found what he was looking for. He didn't let it worry him, though. The scientist chaps had been very insistent that everything was going to be perfectly all right, providing nobody panicked and everybody got on and did their bit in an orderly fashion. He wasn't panicking. As far as he was concerned, everything was going splendidly. He dabbed at his shoulder with a large, frothy sponge. It crept back into his mind that he was feeling mildly irritated about something. Now, what was all that about? A slight cough alerted him to the fact that the ship's first officer was still standing nearby. Nice chap, number one. Not of the very brightest, had the odd spot of difficulty tying his shoelaces, but jolly good officer with material for all that. The captain wasn't a man to kick a chap when he was bending over trying to do up his shoelaces, however long it took him. Not like that ghastly number two, stuttering, strutting about all over the place, polishing his buttons, issues reports of every hour. 
Ship still moving, Captain. Still on course, Captain. Oxygen levels being maintained, Captain. Give it a miss. Was was the captain's vote. Ah, yes. That was the thing he had, that had been irritating him. He peered down at number one. Yes, Captain, he was shouting something or other about having found some prisoners. The captain thought about this. Seemed pretty unlikely to him, but he wasn't one to stand in his officer's way. Well, perhaps that'll keep him happy for a bit, he said. He's always wanted some. Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent trudged onward up the ship's apparently endless corridors. Number two marched behind them, barking the occasional order about not making any false moves or trying any funny stuff. They seemed to have passed at least a mile of continuous, brown, hessian wall weave. Finally, they reached a large steel door which slid open when number two shouted at it. They entered. To the eyes of Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent, the most remarkable thing about the ship's bridge was not the 50-foot diameter hemispherical dome which covered it, and through which the dazzling display of stars shone down on them. To people who have eaten at the restaurant at the end of the universe, such wonders are commonplace. Nor was it the bewildering ar array of instruments that crowded the long, circumferential wall around them. To Arthur, this was exactly what spaceships were traditionally supposed to look like, and to Ford it looked thoroughly antiquated. It confirmed his suspicions that Disaster Area stunt ship had taken them back at least a million, if not two million, years before their own time. No, the thing that really caught them off balance was the bathtub. The bathtub stood on a six-foot pedestal of rough-hewn blue water crystal and was of a baroque monstrosity not often seen outside the Maximegalon Museum of Diseased Imaginings. An intestinal jumble of plumbing had been picked out in gold leaf rather than decently buried at midnight in an unmarked grave. The taps and shower attachment would have made a gargoyle jump. As the dominant centerpiece of a starship bridge, it was terribly wrong, and it was with the embittered air of a man who knew this that number two approached it. Captain Sir, he shouted through clenched teeth, a difficult trick, but he'd been, he had years during which to perfect it. A large, genial face and a genial foam-covered arm popped up above the rim of the monstrous bat. Ah, hello, number two, said the captain, waving a cheery sponge. Having a nice day? Number two snapped even further to attention than he already was. I've brought you the prisoners I located in Freezer Bay 7, sir, he yapped. Ford and Arthur coughed in confusion. Uh, hello, they said. The captain beamed at them. So, number two had really found some prisoners. Well, good for him, thought the captain. Nice to see a chap doing what he's best at. Oh, hello, hello there, he said to them. Excuse me not getting up, just having a quick bath. Well, gin and tonics all around then. Look in the fridge, number one. Certainly, sir. It is a curious fact, and one to which no one knows quite how much importance to attach, that something like 85% of all known worlds in the galaxy, be they primitive or highly advanced, have invented a drink called gin and tonics, or G-N-N-T apostrophe N-I-X, or gin and onyx, or any other of a thousand or more variations on the same phonetic theme. The drinks themselves are not the same and vary between the Sevolvian Chinanto Mnings, which is ordinary water served at slightly above room temperature, and the, ga the Gagrakakan Zin Anthony X, which kills cows at a hundred paces. And in fact, the one common factor between all of them, beyond the fact that the names sound the same, is that they were all invented and named before the worlds concerned made contract contact with any other worlds. What can be made of this fact? It exists in total isolation. As far as any theory of structural linguistics is concerned, it is right off the graph, and yet it persists. Old structural linguistics get very angry when young structural linguistics go on about it. Young structural linguists get deeply excited about it and stay up late at night convinced they are very close to something of profound importance and end up becoming old structural linguists before their time getting very angry with the young ones 
Structural linguistics is a bitterly divided and unhappy discipline, and a large number of its practitioners spend too many nights drowning their problems in oisian sodas. Taking a moment to read some chats. Yep, the Twitch will always be full of thirsty trolls, my dear. Hello, long boy. I am reading. Hello, Chess Choppin. Welcome. Like I said, lurkers are welcome and encouraged. There's like a hair touching me. I'm very unhappy right now. How is everyone today? <clears throat> Number two stood before the captain's bathtub, trembling with frustration. Don't you want to interrogate the prisoners, sir? He squealed. The captain peered at him in bemusement. Why on Golgofrinchum would I want to do that? He asked. To get information out of them, sir, to find out why they came here. Oh, no, 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 said the captain. I expect they just dropped in for a quick gin and tonics, don't you? But, sir, they're my prisoners. I must interrogate them. The captain looked at them doubtfully. Oh, all right, he said. If you must, ask them what they want to drink. A hard, cold gleam came into number two's eyes. He advanced slowly on Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent. All right, you scum, he growled. You vermin, he jabbed Ford with the killer zap gun. Steady on, number two, admonished the captain gently. What do you want to drink, number two screamed. Well, the gin and tonic sounds very nice to me, said Ford. What about you, Arthur? Arthur blinked. What? Uh, uh, yes, he said. With ice or without, bellowed number two. Oh, with, please, said Ford. Lemon? Yes, please, said Ford. And do you have any of those little biscuits, you know, the cheesy ones? I'm asking the questions, howled number two, his body quaking with apoplectic fury. Uh, number two, said the captain softly. Sir! Shove off, would you? There's a good chap. I'm trying to have a relaxing bath. Number two's eyes narrowed and became what are known in the shouting and killing people trade as cold slits, the idea presumably being to give your opponent the impression that you have lost your glasses or are having difficulty keeping awake. Why this is frightening at is an, as yet, unresolved problem. He advanced on the captain, his, number two's, mouth, a thin, hard line. Again, tricky to know why this is understood as fighting behavior. If, while wandering through the jungle of Troll, you were suddenly to come upon the fabled ravenous bug bladder beast, you would have reason to be grateful if its mouth was a thin, hard line, rather than, as it usually is, a gaping mass of slobbering fangs. May I remind you, sir, hissed number two at the captain, that you have now been in that bath for over three years. The final shot delivered, number two spun on his heel and stalked off to a corner to practice darting eye movements in the, in the mirror. The captain squirmed in his bath. He gave Ford, Ford Prefect a lame smile. Well, you need to relax a lot in a job like mine, he said. Ford slowly lowered his hands. It provoked no reaction. Arthur lowered his. Treading very slowly and carefully, Ford moved over to the bath pedestal. He patted it. Nice, he lied. He wondered if it was safe to grin. Very slowly and carefully he grinned. It was safe. Uh, he said to the captain. Yes, said the captain. I wonder, said Ford, could I ask you actually what your job is in fact? A hand tapped him on the shoulder. He spun around. It was the first officer. Your drinks, he said. Ah, thank you, said Ford. He and Arthur took their gin and tonics. Arthur sipped his and was surprised to discover it tasted very like a whiskey and soda. 
I mean, I couldn't help noticing, said Ford, also taking a sip, the bodies in the hold. Bodies? said the captain in surprise. Ford paused and thought to himself. Never take anything for granted, he thought. Could it be that the captain doesn't know he's got 15 million dead bodies on his ship? The captain was nodding cheerfully at him. He also appeared to be playing with a rubber duck. Ford looked around. Number two was staring at him in the mirror, but only for an instant. His eyes were constantly on the move. The first officer was just standing there, holding the drinks tray and smiling benignly. Bodies, said the captain again. Ford licked his lips. Yes, he said. All those dead telephone sanitizers and account executives, you know, down in the hold. The captain stared at him. Suddenly, he threw his head back and laughed. Oh, they're not dead, he said. Good Lord, no, no, they're frozen. They're going to be revived. Ford did something he very rarely did. He blinked. Arthur seemed to come out of a trance. You mean you've got a hold full of frozen hairdressers? He said. Oh, yes, said the captain. Millions of them. Hairdressers, tired TV producers, insurance salesmen, personnel officers, security guards, public relations executives, management consultants, you name it, we're going to colonize another planet. Ford wobbled very slightly. Exciting, isn't it? said the captain. What with that lot? said Arthur. Ah, now don't misunderstand me, said the captain. We're just one of the ships in the Ark fleet. We're the Bee Ark, you see. Sorry, could I just ask you to run a bit more hot water for me? Arthur obliged, and a cascade of pink, frothy water swirled around in the bath. The captain let out a sigh of pleasure. Thank you very much, my dear fellow. Do help yourselves to more drinks, of course. Ford tossed down his drink, took the bottle from the first officer's tray, and refilled his glass to the top. What, he said, is a bee arc? This is, said the captain, and swished the foamy water around joyfully with the duck. Yes, said Ford, but... Well, what happened, you see, was, said the captain, our planet, the world from which we have come, was, so to speak, doomed. Doomed? Oh, yes. So what everyone thought was, let's pack the whole population into some giant spaceships and go and settle on another planet. Having told this much of his story, he settled back with a satisfied grunt. You mean a less doomed one? prompted Arthur. What did you say, dear fellow? A less doomed planet you're, you were going to settle on. Are going to settle on, yes. So it was decided to build three ships, you see, Three arcs in space, and I'm not boring you, am I? No, no, said Form firmly. Ford, firmly. It's fascinating. You know, it's delightful, reflected the captain, to have someone else to talk to for a change. Number two's eyes darted feverishly about the room again, and then settled back on the mirror like a pair of flies briefly distracted from their favorite piece of month-old meat. Trouble with a long journey like this, continued the captain, is that you end up just talking to yourself a lot, which gets terribly boring because half the time you know what you're going to say next. Only half the time? asked Arthur in surprise. The captain thought for a moment. Yes, about half, I'd say. Anyway, where's the soap? He fished around and found it. Yes, so anyway he resumed. The idea was that into the first ship, the A-ship, would go all the brilliant leaders, the scientists, the great artists, you know, all the achievers, and then into the third or C-ship would go all the people who did the actual work, who made things and did things, and then put into the B-ship, that's us, would go everyone else, the middlemen, you see. He smiled happily at them. And we were sent off first, he concluded, and hummed a little bathing tune. The little bathing tune, which had been composed for him by one of his, his world's most exciting and prolific jingle writers, who was currently asleep in hold 36, some 900 yards behind them, covered what would otherwise have been an awkward moment of silence. Ford and Arthur shuffled their feet and furiously avoided each other's eyes. Ah, uh, said Arthur, after a moment. 
What exactly was it that was wrong with your planet, then? Oh, it was doomed, as I said, said the captain. Apparently it was going to crash into the sun or something. Or maybe it was that the moon was going to crash into us. Something of the kind. Absolutely terrifying prospect, whatever it was. Oh, said the officer suddenly. I thought it was that the planet was going to be invaded by a gigantic swarm of 12-foot piranha bees. Wasn't that it? Number two spun around, eyes ablaze with a cold, hard light that only comes with the amount of practice he was prepared to put in. That's not what I was told, he hissed. My commanding officer told me that the entire planet was in imminent danger of being eaten by an enormous mutant star goat. Oh, really, said Ford Prefect. Yes, a monstrous creature from the pit of hell with scything teeth ten thousand miles long, breath that would boil oceans, claws that could tear continents from their roots, a thousand eyes that burn like the sun, slavering jaws a million miles across, a monster such as you have never, never, ever. And they made sure they sent you lot off first, did they? inquired Arthur. Oh, yes, said the captain. Well, everyone said, very nicely, I thought, that it was very important for morale to feel that they would be arriving on a planet where they could be sure of a good haircut, where the phones were clean. Oh, yes, agreed Ford. I can see that would be very important. And the other ships, they followed on after you, did they? For a moment, the captain did not answer. He twisted round in his bath and gazed backward over the huge bulk of the ship toward the bright galactic center. He squinted into the inconceivable distance. Ah, oh, well, it's funny you should say that, he said, and allowed himself a slight frown at Ford Prefect. Because, curiously enough, we haven't heard a peep out of them since we left five years ago. But they must be behind us somewhere. He peered off into the distance again. Ford peered with him and gave a thoughtful frown. Unless, of course, he said softly, they were eaten by the goat. Ah, yes, said the captain, with slight hesitancy creeping into his voice. The goat. His eyes passed over the solid shapes of the instruments and computers that lined the bridge. They winked away innocently at him. He stared out at the stars, but none of them said a word. He glanced at his first and second officers, but they seemed lost in their own thoughts for a moment. He glanced at Ford Prefect, who raised his eyebrows at him. It's a funny thing, you know said the captain at last, but now that I actually come to tell the story to someone else, I mean, does it strike you as odd, number one? Uh, said number one. Well, said Ford, I can see that you've got a lot of things you're going to want to talk about, so thanks for the drinks, and if you could sort of drop us off at the nearest convenient planet. Uh, well, that's a little difficult, you see said the captain, because our trajectory thingy was preset before we left Golga Frinchum, I think partly because I'm not very good with figures. You mean we're stuck here on this ship, exclaimed Ford, suddenly losing patience with the whole charade. When are you meant to be reaching this planet you're meant to be colonizing? Oh, we're nearly there, I think, said the captain. Any second now. It's probably time I was getting out of this bath, in fact. Oh, I don't know, though. Why don't why stop when I'm just enjoying it? So we're actually going to land in a minute, said Arthur. Well, not so much land, in fact. Not actually land as such, no. Uh, well, what are you talking about, said Ford, sharply. Well, said the captain, picking his way through the words carefully. I think as far as I can remember, we were programmed to crash on it. Crash? shouted Ford and Arthur. Uh, yes, said the captain. Yes, it's all part of the plan, I think. There was a terribly good reason for it, which I can't quite remember at the moment. It was something to do with the... Uh... Ford exploded. You're a load of useless bloody loonies, he shouted. Ah, uh, yes, that was it, beamed the captain. That was the reason. I see Cyber has joined us. Welcome back, my dear. Cyber's on a break from college courses and is able to hang out with us for a little bit. And Swag, hi, how are you? 
I am shedding so much hair. I don't know what's happening. <clears throat> I wonder if my coffee is like a drinkable temperature yet. Feels like it. Hmm, a little too much sugar. We missed you too, Cyber. The shed is real. My hair is on everything. It's ridiculous. Like, I feel like a husky or something. All my hair is just falling out. <clears throat> Chapter 25. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has this to say about the planet of Golgofrinchum. It is a planet with an ancient and mysterious history, rich in legend, red, and occasionally green with the blood of those who sought in times gone by to conquer her, a land of parched and barren landscapes of sweet and sultry air beady with the scent of the perfumed springs that trickle over its hot and dusty rocks and nourish the dark and musky lichens beneath, a land of fevered brows and intoxicated imaginings, particularly among those who taste the lichens, a land also of cool and shaded thoughts among those who have learned to forswear the lichens and find a tree to sit beneath, a land also of steel and blood and heroism, a land of the body and of the spirit. This was its history. And in all this ancient and mysterious history, the most mysterious figures of all were without doubt those of the great circling poets of Arium. These circling poets used to live in remote mountain passes where they would lie in wait for small bands of unwary travelers, circle around them, and throw rocks at them. And when the travelers cried out, saying, why didn't they go away and get on with writing some poems instead of pestering people with all this rock-throwing business, they would suddenly stop and then break into one of the 794 great song cycles of Vassilion. These songs were all of extraordinary beauty and even more extraordinary length, and fell into exactly the same pattern. The first part of each song would tell how there once went forth from the city of Vassilion a party of five sage princes with four horses. The princes, who are of course brave, noble, and wise, travel widely in distant lands, fight giant ogres, pursue exotic philosophies, take tea with weird gods, and rescue beautiful monsters from revening princesses, before finally announcing that they have achieved enlightenment and that their wanderings are therefore accomplished. The second and much longer part of each song would tell of all their bickerings about which one of them is going to have to walk back. All this lay in the planet's remote past. It was, however, a descendant of one of these eccentric poets who invented the spurious tales of impending doom, which enabled the people of Golga Frinchum to rid themselves of an entire useless third of their population. The other two thirds stayed firmly at home and lived full, rich, and happy lives until they were all suddenly wiped out by a virulent disease contracted from a dirty telephone. There's a hair on this chair, and it's touching the back of my arm. Ha! I got it. There's always something. Chapter 26. That night, the ship crash-landed onto an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet, which circled a small, unregarded yellow sun in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy. In the hours preceding the crash, Ford Prefect had fought furiously but in vain to unlock the controls of the ship from their preordained flight path. It had quickly become apparent to him that the ship had been programmed to convey its payload safely, if uncomfortably, to its new home, but to cripple itself beyond all hope of repair in the process. Its screaming, blazing descent through the atmosphere had stripped away most of its superstructure and outer shielding, and its final inglorious belly flop into a murky swamp had left its crew only a few hours of darkness during which to revive and offload its deep, frozen, and unwanted cargo, for the ship began to settle almost at once, slowly upending its gigantic bulk and the stagnant slime. Once or twice during the night, it was starkly silhouetted against the sky as burning meteors, the Detritus of its descent flashed across the sky. Detritus? Is it detritus? I think it's detritus. In the gray pre dawn light, it let out an obscene roaring gurgle and sank forever into the stinking depths. 
When the sun came up that morning, it shed its thin, watery light over a vast area, heaving with wailing hairdressers, public relations executives, opinion pollsters, and the rest, all clawing their way desperately to dry land. A less strong-minded sun would probably have gone straight back down again, but it continued to climb its way through the sky, and after a while the influence of its warming rays began to have some restoring effect on the feebly struggling creatures. Countless numbers had, unsurprisingly, been lost to the swamp in the night, and millions more had been sucked down with the ship, but those who survived still numbered hundreds of thousands, and the days... And as the day wore on, they crawled out over the surrounding countryside, each looking for a few square feet of solid ground on which to collapse and recover from their nightmare, nightmare ordeal. Two figures moved further afield. From a nearby hillside, Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent watched the horror of which they could not feel apart. Filthy, dirty trick to pull, muttered Arthur. Ford scraped a stick along the ground and shrugged. An imaginative solution to a problem I'd have thought, he said. Why can't people just learn to live together in peace and harmony, said Arthur. Ford gave a loud, very hollow laugh. Forty-two, he said with a malicious grin. No, doesn't work, never mind. Arthur looked at him as if he'd gone mad, and, seeing nothing to indicate to the contrary, realized that it would be perfectly reasonable to assume that this had, in fact, happened. What do you think will happen to them all? He said after a while. In an infinite universe, anything can happen, said Ford, even survival. Strange, but true. A curious look came into his eyes as they passed over the landscape and then settled again on the scene of misery below them. I think they'll manage for a while, he said. Arthur looked up sharply. Why do you say that? He said. Ford shrugged. Just a hunch, he said and refused to be drawn on and any further questions. Look, he said suddenly. Arthur followed his pointing finger. Down among the sprawling masses, a figure was moving, or perhaps lurching would be a more accurate description. He appeared to be carrying something on his shoulder. As he lurched from prostrate form to prostrate form, he seemed to waver, wave whatever that something was at them in a drunken fashion. After a while, he gave up the struggle and collapsed in a heap. Arthur had no idea what this was meant to mean to him. Movie camera, said Ford, recording the historic moment. Well, I don't know about you, said Ford again after a moment, but I'm off. He sat a while in silence. After a while, this seemed to require comment. Uh, when you say you're off, what do you mean exactly, said Arthur. Good question, said Ford. I'm getting total silence. Looking over his shoulder, Arthur saw that he was twiddling with knobs on a small black box. Ford had already introduced this box to Arthur as a Sabitha Senzimatic, but Arthur had merely nodded absently and not pursued the matter. In his mind, the universe still divided into two parts, the Earth and everything else. The Earth having been demolished to make way for hyperspace bypass meant that this view of things was a little lopsided, but Arthur tended to cling to that lopsidedness as being his last remaining contact with his home. Sabitha Senzimatics belonged firmly in the everything else category. Not a sausage, said Ford, shaking the thing. Sausage, thought Arthur to himself as he gazed listlessly at the primitive world about him. What I wouldn't give for a good earth sausage. Would you believe, said Ford in exasperation, that there are no transmissions of any kind within light years of this benighted tip? Are you listening to me? What? said Arthur. We're in trouble, said Ford. Oh, said Arthur. This sounded like month-old news to him. Until we pick up anything on this machine, said Ford, our chances of getting off this planet are zero. It may be some freak standing wave effect of, in the planet's magnetic field, in which case we just travel round and round till we find a clear reception area. Coming? He picked up his gear and strode off. Arthur looked down the hill. The man with the movie camera had struggled back up to his feet just in time to fill one of, film one of his colleagues collapsing. 
Arthur picked a blade of grass and strode off after Ford. Chapter 27 I trust you had a pleasant meal, said Zarnawoop to Zaphod and Trillian as they rematerialized on the bridge of the starship Heart of Gold and lay painting on the floor. Zaphod opened some eyes and glowered at him. You! he spat. He staggered to his feet and stomped off to find a chair to slump into. He found one and slumped into it. I have reprogrammed the computer with the improbability coordinates pertinent to our journey, said Zarnawoop. We will arrive there very shortly. Meanwhile, why don't you relax and prepare yourself for the meeting? Zaphod said nothing. He got up again and marched over to a small cabinet from which he pulled a bottle of Old Jank's spirit. He took a long pull at it. And when this is all done, said Zaphod savagely, it's done, all right? I'm free to go and do what the hell I like and lie on beaches and stuff. It depends on what transpires from the meeting, said Zarnawoop. Zaphod, who is this man? said Trillian, shakily wobbling to her feet. What's he doing here? Why is he on our ship? He's a very stupid man, said Zaphod, who wants to meet the man who rules the universe. Ah, said Trillian, taking the bottle from Zaphod and helping herself. A social climber. Chapter 28 All cyber subbed! That alert's working. Thanks for the sub! Cyber is one of my um, oldest watchers, oldest followers, one of the first. Whoop, whoop. <clears throat> Chapter 28. The major problem, one of the major problems, for there are several, one of the many major problems with governing people is that of whom you get to do it, or rather of who manages to get people to let them do it to them. To summarize, it is a well-known fact that those people who must want to rule people are, ipso facto, the least suited to do it. To summarize the summary, anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president should, on no account, be allowed to do the job. To summarize the summary of the summary, people are a problem. And so, this is the situation we find. A succession of galactic presidents who so much enjoy the fun and palaver of being in power that they very rarely notice that they are not. And somewhere in the shadows behind them, who? Who can possibly rule if no one who wants to do it can be allowed to? I think we will call it at chapter 28. Pick up tomorrow, starting at chapter 29. And I will take a brief break to eat some food before Jackbox games this afternoon. So it's, uh, what time is it? It is 12.02, so in about one hour, I will be logging back on to play some Quiplash XL and maybe some other games from the pack if we get busy and if anyone else wants to do other games. Um, thank you guys for hanging out and for listening today, OSX. Happy to see you back for the second time. Uh, Cyber, super happy that you're here on your break. Um, thanks for spending that time with me. Duo, good to see you again. Swag, always, always a pleasure. Everyone else who's lurking, hanging out, whose name I can't see in the chat, um, I will be back in about an hour, and I will talk to you guys very soon. Later!